Revelation chapter 17. You all know what that chapter is, amen? You all know what that chapter is, amen? <clears throat> amen, brother. You all used to be a part of this system, and then God delivered you out of this system, amen? <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's right. You are following Steven Anderson. That's better, oh, brother. <laughs> Revelation chapter 17. Not we, praise the Lord, brother. Amen. Woo! Well, uh, I am very blessed to have this church, you know. Ma many of you came from many different uh, wrong doctrines, wrong churches, but the Lord delivered you out of that and Amen. came to this kind of church. Praise God. All right, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 17. End Times and Demons, Part 12, Part 12. <clears throat> the Bible says that the book of 1 Timothy, Chapter 4, that in the last days there shall be doctrine of devils. And in 1 Corinthians, Chapter 2, the Bible says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So these, so these two passages show that we should not be ignorant of Satan's devices. We should be aware of what he's doing. The passage also says that since in the last days there shall be doctrines of devils, we should especially be aware of those doctrines that we should not fall prey into. Amen. So we've seen throughout this series how Satan, he affects churches, he affects governments, politics, and religion. So Satan, he's going to get full on full control over everything. That's what Satan's aiming for. So in Revelation chapter 17, we're going to look at several interesting passages of what Satan's going to do. Now, in my series on end times and demons, you heard about one of the crucial areas, the crucial head elites that started a lot of control over the world. One of them was the round table movement, the round table movement. Now, you're going to find some interesting passages on what the Bible talked about concerning the round table which was adopted out of King Arthur and the Camelot. So you're going to see some interesting things what the devil's doing and what the Bible actually says about that. But first of all let's discuss about the round table that way you can get an idea. Most of these quotes are based off of a Georgetown University historian. His name is Carol Quigley. Carol Quigley. So all, most of it is based off of his studies. In his book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, page 950, it quotes, Until 1870, there was no professorship of fine arts at Oxford. But in that year, John Ruskin was named to such a chair. He hit Oxford like an earthquake, not so much because he talked about fine arts, but because he talked also about the empire and England's downtrodden masses. <clears throat> and above all, because he talked about all three of these things as moral issues. Ruskin's message had a sensational impact. His inaugural lecture was copied out in a long hand by one undergraduate. His name, Cecil Rhodes, who kept it with him for 30 years. For some of you who know Cecil Rhodes during that time period, he was an infamous man who was filthy rich and very powerful. He conquered certain lands in Africa, and one part in Africa was named after him. That's how powerful he was and very rich. He was famous, infamous for his diamond mines. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but in one of my preaching sermons, which was interesting, <clears throat> in my preaching sermon, I told you how Cecil Rhodes died. When he died, he had all the wealth and the power with the diamonds, but he said, why go to a, uh, eternity without Christ? What good was all these riches? So that's something interesting. But Cecil Rhodes, you got to understand, he was one of the most demonic people that the devil used for controlling a lot of part of the world and to start off major elites, actually, that some conspiracy theorists go bonkers about, such as the CFR and the CIA and a lot of politics in the government. All of that actually was traced, you would find out, to the round table, to Cecil Rhodes. And then those of you who have uh, been there in my end times and studies, you know who, which group of religions, which two religions really were part of that round table, which you can guess were Masons and Catholics, the Jesuits, which I will show you later on. So Cecil Rhodes, <clears throat> he, how it started, his idea about the round table, the movement, and then having power over certain nations, it started in a lecture class at John Ruskin at Oxford. 
So while a student over there at Oxford, he was motivated by this idea about England, because during that time, you know, the Victorian Empire was very large. English colonialism was spreading all over, imperialism. So it's because of that time that, jo that Cecil Rhodes, motivated by the idea of John Ruskin's message, he wanted to conquer more lands. In pages 950 to 951, he gives how the Roundtable group started and what came out. Quote, the Roundtable groups were semi-secret discussion and lobbying groups organized on behalf of Lord Milner, the dominant trustee of the Rhodes Trust. The original purpose of these groups was to seek to federate the English-speaking world along lines laid down by Cecil Rhodes and William T. Stead. And the money for the organizational work came originally from the Rhodes Trust. <clears throat> By 1915, roundtable groups existed in seven countries, including England and the United States. Since 1925, there have been substantial contributions from wealthy individuals. Now look at the powerhouses and elites that came out. And from foundations and firms associated with the international banking fraternity, especially organizations associated with J.P. Morgan, the Rockefeller and Whitney families, and the associates of, of Lazard Brothers and of Morgan, Grenfell and Company. In pages 951 and 952, he also discusses how the CFR came to be, which is very true. How the CFR came to be, Council on Foreign Relations today, is because of the round table, you gotta understand. In this quote, at the end of the war of 1914, <clears throat> it became clear that the organization of this system had to be greatly extended. The task was entrusted to Lionel Curtis, who established in England and each dominion a front organization to the existing local roundtable group. This front organization, called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, had as its nucleus in each area the existing submerged round table group. In New York, it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations <clears throat> and was a front for J.P. Morgan and company in association with the very small American round table group. In fact, the original plans for the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations were drawn up at Paris. For those of you who attended my previous studies at End Times and De Demons, I gave you a little tease, a little example of the Council on Foreign Relations. There were many powerful presidents who came from that group, as well as the secretary in power in charge of military. A lot of them came from the CFR. CFR is a very powerful organization that a lot of powerful politicians, government leaders, those who are certain chairs of the Federal Reserve, they all came from that group, see? So you can see that the CFR is a very powerful organization that spread all those elites. But the round table group, you noticed, was the one that came to be the CFR eventually. Dr. Ruckman in his book, Black is Beautiful, I'm not gonna give that quotation, but he believed and taught this way, that the CFR was the inward group and then the outward group was the CIA. Now, this is by Admiral Chester Ward. Admiral, okay, a very esteemed admiral who was a CFR member for 16 years. He gives an example of their power. He quotes, the CFR as such does not write the platforms of both political parties or select their respective presidential candidates. <coughs> so then who is? But CFR members as individuals acting in concert with other individual CFR members do. Thus, David Rockefeller does not exercise vast powers because he is chairman of the board of directors of CFR, but because he is chairman of the board of one of the two most powerful banks in the world. His influence extends into finance, business, industry, transportation, communications, the press, television, universities, foundations, international organizations, and government. He has similar influence throughout the free world and is now rapidly expanding into the communist world. This is a CFR member for 16 years, 
a respectable position, Admiral Chester Ward. It's found in his book, Kissinger on the Couch, pages 150 to 151. So you notice right here what's really in charge of the CFR. It's not as ideal as you think as a whole bunch of members in a group committee. It's more of individual powers, elites, who are behind the scenes doing that. And he gives one example. It's the bankers right here. So you notice right here how certain hands are behind the scenes, certain individual elites behind the scenes are the ones that control and handle how society runs today, you can see. You notice that. Here's Bruce Lockhart. He's a personal envoy of Lord Milner. And this is very interesting. This guy was a personal envoy of Lord Milner. Remember, Lord Milner was the one who started the roundtable group with Cecil Rhodes. Bruce Lockhart, he stated how Stalin, during the Bolshevik Revolution, how it was influenced by the roundtable. So he was a personal envoy of Lord Milner, and this is what he stated, how it worked with Stalin. This is pretty interesting. I returned from my interview to our flat only to find an urgent message from Robbins requesting me to come to see him at once. I found him in a state of great agitation. He had been in conflict with Salkine, a nephew of Trotsky, and then assistant commissar for foreign affairs. Salkine had been rude, and the American who had a promise from Lenin that whatever happened, a train would always be ready for him at an hour's notice, was determined to exact an apology or to leave the country. When I arrived, he had just fi finished telephoning to Lenin. Now this is interesting. He had delivered his ultimatum and Lenin had promised to give a reply within 10 minutes. I waited while Robbins fumed. Then the telephone rang and Robbins picked up the receiver. Lenin had capitulated. Saul Kine was dismissed from his post. <laughs> uh, this is found at Bruce Lockhart's book, British Agent, pages 225 to 226. So I don't know if you notice in this quote right here, but what happened was that Saul Kine was causing problems with them. So then he phoned Lenin and in the end, what did Lenin do? He dismissed Salkine because he was causing problems with Robbins, Bruce Lockhart, and the Round Table. This was during the Bolshevik Revolution. Why? Because these powerful elites who had all the money, 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 who had all the influence. Remember, the Round Table group had so many powerful bankers with them. Remember the movie that came out that was really popular, The Big Short, that came out that won a lot of Academy Awards? They even realized, liberals even realized that bankers, that's why the Democrats and Obama went all over the banks and all that. They even realized, see, how powerful the banks have in influencing society. But this round table, they had all these people and powerful elites and bankers. So you notice how they had influence influence not on just American and England politicians but even communists. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because if you're a powerful person and you want to pay the money and have control over people, you're going to go with the flow. Yeah. You're going to go with the flow. That's why the Vatican, they went with the Nazis. They went with the Nazis that time. And then the, what? Then they returned back to America. But that's a whole other different documentation. Read the Godfather's comic by Jack Chick, Avro Manhattan's book. Uh, what was uh, his book titled? The Vatican Bill Billions? Or, and also read The Secret History of the Jesuits. That will be found on kjv1611.org. All documented by news reporters and people who actually interviewed. Really interesting stuff. But anyways, you notice right here that there is a certain hidden amount of hands, elites, that control behind the scenes. Do you know why this has to happen? I'll tell you why this has to happen. It's because Satan, he has to control not just religiously, but politically too. He's, gonna, he's preparing his control over the world literally, you got to understand. He is literally preparing for that one day. Here is Frank. I think I'm pronouncing his right name right. Adelet. He's the director of the Rhodes Trust. He was, he's the director of the Rhodes Trust from Cecil Rhodes. 
He quoted that Rhodes wanted to organize, quote, so great a power as to hereafter render wars impossible. That's found in Frank Adelitz writing The Vision of Cecil Rhodes, Oxford University Press, London, 1946, page 5. So Cecil Rhodes, you notice, when he got his roundtable movement going, that was a key pinnacle and factor that started a lot of these powerful elitists, and that's where conspiracy theorists started to catch up and start to say, you see, it's the CFR, see, it's the trilateral, it's the Bilderbergers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But all of that came from, you notice, from the roundtable, from Cecil Rhodes. That's how it came to be, all these powerful organizations. But then you'll notice there are two key religions who is behind the round table, which is no surprise. They are the Masons and they are the Jesuits. Here's Rhodes' Confession of Faith. This is by Rhodes' Confession of Faith. That can, if you want a copy of that, it is by the compliments of Dr. Stanley Monsteith organization in his Sustainable Development Syllabus. He actually had those papers, so he gives out copies of that if you're interested. But here's his confession of faith, quote, In the present day, this is Cecil Rhodes, I become a member of the Masonic Order. I see the wealth and power they possess, the influence they hold, and I think over their ceremonies, and I wonder that a large body of men can devote themselves to what at times appears the most ridiculous and absurd rites without an object and without an end. The idea gleaming and dancing before one's eyes like a will o' the wisp at last frames itself into a plan. Why should we not form a secret society with but one object, the furtherance of the British Empire for the bringing of the whole uncivilized world under British rule for the recovery of the United States for the making the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire? So you notice right here that in Cecil Rhodes' confession, he was involved with Masons because of the power and the influence they had. You've got to realize this, church, is that a lot of these people who join religions, they only do it for culture or for power or for reputation. They don't have to be a dedicated, faithful religionist to the Mason to Masonry or to Catholicism or etc. You'd be surprised how many of these Masons don't even know what their organization teaches. And when you tell them what their organization teaches, they'll get a blank look on their face and they'll go, what? I remember my dad, he, I'm not gonna mention the person name, but he was actually uh, t talking to this rich person who was a very rich person, but he was involved with Masons. Because see, the prestige and reputation associated with that. And when my dad told him all these things that the Masons did, <laughs> that person g g was like open jaw. He's like, he couldn't believe that. And he's like, no. Nah. But when he got deeper, he quit Masonry after that. <laughs> because see, that's the thing is that if they want to control over all the world, how do you do that? Make you ignorant like you are right now because this is the first time you're hearing it. Because if this stuff got out, what do you think people would do? That's what Satan does. Satan, he, keep, he wants to keep things hidden and in secret so that you are ignorant of his devices. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. For, this is quoted in Dr. Stanley Monteith's book on page 109, Brotherhood of Darkness, but he's quoting Frederick White's The Life of William T. Stead. William T. Stead, he was, remember, one of the people involved with the round table. This is pretty interesting what kind of powerful people were involved in this round table. The talk concentrated presently upon the secret society, the society of the elect, who were to bind themselves to work for the British Empire in the way, how? In which the Jesuits worked for the Church of Rome. That's how it was organized and made. I think some of you might remember in my previous End Times and Demons study, I showed you that, that when the round table was organized, that their ideal format was the Jesuits, how to organize it. But anyways, let me continue reading here. I telegraphed for Brett, who came two hours later, and we had a long talk. The net upshot of which was that the ideal arrangement would be, so far as we could see at present, so here's the organized people, Rhodes, obviously, General of the Society, Stead Brett Milner to be the Junta of Three, after Rhodes, Stead to be general, with a third who might be Rothschild, 
Now, those of you who studied Rothschild, you would remember that he was the one that funded the Illuminati to begin with during the, uh, during the foundation of America. But I'm not going to get into all that. So notice that they had some powerful people involved in this. So we had Rothschild here in succession. Behind them, Manning. He's a powerful Catholic cardinal. The Booths, Little Johnston, Albert Gray, Arthur Balfour. I don't know if you know that name, but Arthur Balfour was one of the people responsible for giving Palestine to the Jews. See how powerful these people are? To constitute a circle of initiates. So you notice right here that when this round table was formed, really powerful people were involved right here. Really powerful people. And they adopted the format to be what the Jesuits wanted. So who's the head of the Jesuit organization? The general. That's why they put Rhodes as what they called the position as general. Here's another quote about from Catholicism.org. This is from Catholicism.org. This is written by the Catholics themselves. This is by the Catholics themselves. This is very interesting what they said about King Arthur. The title of the article is King Arthur's Round Table Found? With a question mark. According to UK's Telegraph, researchers exploring the legend of Britain's most famous knight believe his stronghold of Camelot was built on the site of a recently discovered Roman amphitheater in Chester. Is not his name King Arthur, the one that comes to mind when we think of the first Christian leader, whose heroism and skill at arms routes all enemies of the faith and the civilization born of it. His name and the names of his knights of the round table, Percival, Lancelot, Lancelot Gawain, etc. The fame of Arthur has lasted for 15 centuries. Children believe in him, but most adults today seem to think he was never anything but a myth. Scholars know that there is documentary evidence that he existed. Here Arthur, this is interesting, here Arthur carried the image of Mary, ever virgin, on his shoulder, through whose virtue and that of Jesus Christ. So King Arthur, if some of you don't know about him, during the time when the Roman Catholic Church was born and forming, during that time they were known as Christian kings. But those Christian kings were actually Catholics if you studied church history. If you study church history, everyone knows that the Christian kings at that time, what was considered the Orthodox Christian group, they were actually Catholic in their beliefs. So King Arthur was one of those early kings during that time, during the birth of the Roman Catholic Church. And during that time period, he was considered Catholic. So here's something very interesting that you're going to notice. There's a real group that exists that controls the people of this world today, and it was originated by the Round Table. But their religions forming it, that they were adopted from, was Masons and Jesuits. And I'm not going to get into all that detail because I gave you details on that in our other video, which is pretty interesting. But anyways, aside from that, we notice right here that th there are literally powerful elites who came from the round table. Coincidentally, they call it round table. Why? Because of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Coincidentally, they like to call it, they want to format it to, according to the Catholic way. And coincidentally, King Arthur and the Round Table, they were Catholics. You know what's also some other interesting gems? You know what JFK, uh, the president, the famous president who was assassinated, you know what his era, era was famously called, that liberal president? So this can be found in an epilogue in Life magazine, December 6, 1963, pages 158 to 159. If you know your history, then you'll know what that era was famously called by Jackie Kennedy. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. There will be great presidents again, but there will never be another Camelot. It was interestingly and famously known as Camelot. So we see here a president who was part of a socialistic party of more government control that his era was interestingly called Camelot. That group, the round table, who wanted more control over society, interestingly called, adopted round table from King Arthur. And Bill Clinton, who is part of that party of Democrats promoting socialistic ideas. Look, I don't care what the media say. It's socialism. I don't care what you say. You just put pretty words to replace it, all right? 
side note, ca call it communism, socialism, democracy, liberal democracy. I, I, all these terms I see, it's so silly. You're right, they have their differences, but you know what they all share in common? I'll tell you what they all share in common. What they all share in common is an organization that forces people, that forces people to give money, that forces control. That's what they all share in common. So that's why I call it socialistic. I don't care if you call it politically incorrect. It is socialism. You better thank God I'm not like Dr. Upman calling them a bunch of communists. <laughs> but that's what they all share in common. Anyways, Bill Clinton, he was a Rhodes Scholar. Everyone goes to Camelot. See, everyone goes to Camelot for control. Everyone goes to Camelot for controlling nations, for power of control. Very interesting. And you know what? The Bible does show that, that there is some sort of Arthur and that there is some sort of Catholic, interestingly, if you want to control and have power over the world. Do you know what? Do you know who King Arthur is supposed to be the son of? Uther Pendragon. You know what that literally means? <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but Pendragon means head dragon. That's what it means. Pendragon means head dragon. Coincidentally, interestingly, King Arthur is a son of that. Anyways, King Arthur was Catholic, was he not? He is Catholic royalty. Look at Revelation chapter 17. Who will be in control over the world? Catholic royalty. Catholic royalty. See, you have to be part of this powerhouse. If you want to control the nation, you have to be part of Catholic royalty. Look at Revelation chapter 17 verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, Unto me come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. With whom, what, the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. See, a royalty power that's above the kings, that kings submit to. Let's also look at verse 4. Is, isn't this royalty and isn't this Catholic? And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. What religion dresses up in purple and red robes? And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Who, who puts ornaments of gold, silver, precious stones upon themselves? Having a golden cup in her hand. Oh, what religion has a golden cup that you see every Sunday Mass? Amen. And the Bible calls it full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. That is definitely the Catholic Church. If you look at verse 6. That is more plainly the Catholic Church. And I saw the women drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. What religion became infamously known for the blood of the martyrs that a book had to be adopted called Fox's Book of Martyrs? The Roman Catholic Church. See, this is, whether you like to say it or not, this is the Roman Catholic Church. Let's also look at verse 9. And here's a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. What city is known as a city on the seven hills? Rome. See, this woman is Rome, whether you like to believe it or not. This is Rome. This is a Roman Catholic church. So notice right here who will play a very powerful part in ruling all the nations in the tribulation. Catholic royalty. Catholic royalty. That's why it is so interesting that the round table, to have power over nations, they adopted Catholic royalty on King Arthur and his knights of the round table. But let's also look at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13. You know who will have to rule over the world? You know who will rule over the world? The dragon. The dragon will rule all nations. It will submit under his authority and power. It is just so interesting how these powerful elites will have to take names that adopt to the dragon. You see what's going on here? What's going on here, see, is Satan's demonic spirit behind the scenes. Amen. 
Satan's demonic spirit behind the scenes to control over the world. Let's look at Revelation chapter 13 and we'll look at verse 4. And they worshipped who? The dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Whether you like to believe it or not, you will worship the dragon. You will worship Satan. You're going to worship the dragon. Oh, I can't imagine that. I can't picture that. Don't you already see it going on? Oh, I'm sorry, you don't, because no one told you about this stuff. About certain elites behind the scenes, led by the dragon, Satan himself, controlling all these things in our world. See what Satan's preparing? Satan is preparing under people's noses. That's how you fool people to eventually worship him one day. You know how you get people to worship him one day? Do it through people's ignorance where they don't know. Because he knows if people knows, they're going to stay away from him. Satan's not going to come out like 666 with demonic horns and go, I'm the Antichrist, stay away from me. He's not going to do that. He will do it subtly. He will do it in your ignorance where you can't tell you're worshiping the dragon. That's why what did Matthew 24 said? If the Antichrist reigned longer, if the Antichrist reigned longer, he could have deceived the elect. He will come out so subtly you would think it's Jesus Christ. That's right. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So you notice right here that there are powerful elites behind the scenes that are controlling certain parts of the nation and they are influencing our world. However, that is not the main enemy which Alex Jones and all these people will concentrate. You know, it's, it's not, don't make a big deal about Catholic, 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 you know. It's the CFR, it's the Bilderbergers. They're just a tool on what's really behind the scene. Amen. They're just a simple tool on what's really behind the scene. You know why? Because if you're not a saved Christian, you're going to believe all these kind of weird, crazy conspiracy theory stuff, and all you are is you're just looking at the little guys. That's, right. That's all you're looking at. All you're doing is looking at little guys, and you don't know which one's fact from fiction. But how can we tell fact from fiction, preacher? Amen. Amen. The Bible already told you who's the head in charge. It. It's going to be Satan and Roman Catholic royalty. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't tell me that book is not ahead of you. King Arthur, so then he's the son of the dragon. Who will be the king over the world who's the son of Satan? Don't tell me that book is not ahead of you. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. The Antichrist, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the Antichrist, what is he called? The son of perdition. See, here is Jesus Christ, God the Son, who will rule over the world. Oops, excuse me. It's the Antichrist, the son of Satan, who will rule over the world. You know what Satan always wants to do, church? He always wants to imitate what God does. He always wants to imitate what Jesus Christ does. God has his son. The devil has his own son, too. And boy, he's going to be the king who will rule over the world. They're going to mistake God, the son of Satan, to be God the son. They're going to mistake him to be Jesus Christ. That's why he's called the Antichrist. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Here's Satan's boy right here. here here's Satan's boy right here. Look at John chapter 6, verse 70. John chapter 6, verse 70. Who is Satan's boy right here, Pastor? The Bible showed you. Jesus did it right on your face, too. Look at John chapter 6. We will look at verse 70. He was there. He was there during Jesus' ministry. So he'll know how Jesus runs, and he'll imitate how Jesus ran. Look at John chapter 6, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, twelve disciples, and one of you is a what? Devil. Devil. This guy is a child of Satan. Who is it? Verse 71. He spake of who? Judas Iscariot. That's why what did Jesus interestingly said during the Last Supper? It is better that he would not have been born. 
and he was speaking about Judas Iscariot. You know why? Because this is Satan's boy, and he's going to use Judas Iscariot to become the Antichrist. Whoa! Preacher, really? Yeah, you haven't been reading your Bible. Remember 2 Thessalonians 2? The 2 Thessalonians 2 said the son of perdition is the Antichrist, yes? Mm -hmm. You know who's called the son of perdition? Go to John 17. John chapter 17. You haven't been reading your Bible. They're not going to tell you this stuff. Look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'll tell you who the son of perdition is. So we notice right here that at verse 1, verse 2, Jesus Christ is speaking about his disciples, right? Thank you, Lord, for giving these to me. He's talking about his 12 disciples. Look at verse 12 now. While I was with them in the world, so Jesus is talking about his 12 disciples. I was with these 12 disciples. I kept them in my, thy name. So these 12 disciples, Lord, are kept in your name. Except who? Those that thou gavest me, those 12 disciples, I have kept. And none of them is lost. Except who? But who? The son of perdition. See, Judas Iscariot is the son of perdition. Amen. He is the Antichrist. Here comes King Arthur. No, King Judas. King go. Judas right there. Son of Uther Pendragon. Son of Satan. Be not ignorant of his devices, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. So you notice right here what Satan, he's suddenly coming in. He's suddenly coming in where people don't realize it. And then one day he will come down as dragon. He will come out with his son, with Roman Catholic royalty, who will rule over the world. And right now, underneath your noses, it's forming right now. Right. It's forming right now to prepare for that one world government of the Antichrist, preparing soon for that one day. Satan has to prepare it. You've got to realize this, church. If Satan's going to deceive the whole world, he can't just do it immediately like that. You know how Satan deceives people? Which I know happened to you. Amen. He does it underneath your nose where you don't see it and pay attention. And then he nibbles little by little by little by little, seeps in more and more and more and more, and then finally he got a hold of you and you still don't realize that you've been caught. Amen. Amen. Yes, hasn't he been doing that with you, church? He's been doing that with you. What makes you think that if he, can't, if he can do that with you, with the Holy Spirit in you, what makes you think he can't do that with lost people who don't have the Holy Spirit? Oh, I won't worship Satan. Oh, I won't kill the Christians. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. I don't care what you say. Because Satan is going underneath, subtly deceiving you where you don't see this stuff going on. And then guess what happened? Just like the Jews, Hosanna in the highest. What happened a couple days later? Crucify him. That's right. You see what Satan can do? He can turn your and warp your mind. He is a very subtle, crafty creature. He's a subtle, crafty creature. And that's what he's doing right now. He's putting the chess pieces in place. See, He's putting the chess pieces in place where people don't see it and don't recognize it. And people will go, oh, no, you know, I think you're kind of stretching it right here. And no, there's no such thing as one world government. No, the Bible told you there will be a one world government. Yeah. The Bible told you there will be one. And because you don't believe in it, that's why you're going to be the sucker who will join it in the end. Amen. You won't even realize you're putting 666 on your right hand. That's right. That's, you're going to say, oh, that, yeah, 666 on right hand. No way that's going to happen. Ridiculous. And no, I don't, I, I, I can't imagine me putting 666 on my right hand. Oh yeah, he's going to do a good job suddenly deceiving you. Because you know why? He's doing it right now. He's doing it right now underneath your nose, nibbling, nibbling. And you've seen glimpses of it already. Really, Pastor? Uh, yeah, duh, you blind? You, you blind? When Hillary Clinton lost, did you see the liberals' reaction? They flipped! They got mad. What, what are you saying, Pastor? Because don't you know <laughs> the Democrat, they're pushing that ideology of government having more control. You know who the real evil people are? The real evil people are the Christians. The real evil people are the conservatives, the capitalists. But you know what, they're, what, what Satan's trying to do is using that as a cover-up to go behind the scenes, make you pay attention to the wrong enemy, 
rather than the right enemy who's going lurking behind the scenes and controlling people unconsciously without them knowing about it. Don't you people realize when you're voting in certain politicians and presidents what you're voting in for? See, they don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. You know what you're voting in for? You're voting in things where it will promote more and more allowance of sin, homosexual marriage, abortion, legalization of drugs, and the government having more and more control. Why? Because a lot of the people are being cheated out by rich companies, and a lot of people need special protection. See what the devil's doing? See, he uses that to trick you so that you don't see what Satan's trying to do. You know what Satan will do? This is something you got to understand that I think people don't realize. Satan will use good intentions, good reasons to accomplish his goal if he has to. You know that? He will. He will do that. How did he create Roman Catholic religion? Hey, are we doing Satan? Is Satanism the number one religion in the world today? No. What Satan had to do was compromise using good reasons and motives of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus, Jesus Christ. And that's why he was willing to forsake paganism and go with the church. And that's why you ended up with the Roman Catholic Church. And that's why it will be Roman Catholic royalty who will be in power in the end. Amen. Satan can't destroy the King James Bible. What, do you think, uh, do you think Lucifer's Satan Bible is the one that all the world looks up to? That's what Satan's using? No. He knows he can't do that. So he's going to use good motives, good intentions of these scholars who say, we're trying to make the Bible better and easier to read. And using that to poison people to get rid of the right Bible. And that's why you got hundreds, literally hundreds of different modern Bibles. Modern versions. And you don't have the King James Version. That's what he's doing, see, with presidents of the United States. That's what he's doing with politicians. That's what he's doing with teachers and professors in schools. That's what he's doing in Hollywood right now. That's what he's doing, all that kind of stuff. And all these people, yes, good hearts, good motive, good intentions. But you got to look behind that. You got to look at the demonic spirit behind the scene of what, how Satan can use that. And I think that's what even saved Christians don't do today too. You know what you save Christians do when you try to serve God and when you do things in your life? You, don't th you always think about good motives and good intentions behind it, but you don't ask yourself this. Could the devil use that for something? You see how Sa if Satan fooled you like that many times in your life, of course he's going to fool these ignorant masses. Of course he can do that. You see what Satan's doing? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's trying to get all the world into his one hand soon. Under Catholic, Catholic royalty will be one of the main powers, and they will all worship the dragon without them even knowing about it. They're going to think that this is Jesus Christ. They are setting things up. They are pushing ideologies that Satan wants you to believe in. So that why? I'll tell you why. So that he can get full dominance and control over all of this world. But guess what? He's going to lose the battle. Jesus Christ will be the victor in the end. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ will be the victor in the end. Kick out Satan from his throne. These elites, they don't even know what they're doing. A lot of them, they just get obsessed with power and that's it. But if you go way back in history, where does it go way back to? You, we've studied this church. Where does it go way back to? The Masonic Oath and the Jesuit Oath. Their, their master, they worship the God of this world is Satan. He is Satan. See what everyone is? Everyone is a chess piece. Everyone is a chess piece. And Satan's going to use that to deceive so many people. He's going to deceive so many people and damn their souls to hell. That's why we are not ignorant of his devices that Satan should get an advantage advantage of us. In the last days there shall be doctrines of devils. That's why this stuff is important to know. That way we can see what Satan's trying to do. And that should emburden us and make us realize, hey, you know what? I should think twice before I commend some kind of Hollywood star or some politician. You, you better watch your mouth on that. Amen. You know what Bible believers do? This is so simple for Bible believers. We know that everyone is a chess piece under Satan's hand. It doesn't matter, conservative, conservative or liberal, it doesn't matter. Everyone is, in, is a chess piece for Satan who will bring up the one world government. We don't know exact details and specifics. Some of it is just whacked out theory and loony that I don't even know about. But what we do know as we filter out through scripture is that generally 
Everyone is a chess piece for Satan, and they have control over this world, and that's what they're promoting. But people in the world so blinded to that. They think that what? They're going to think, like all these liberals, we need that for our protection, for the government to protect our rights as citizens, they call it. See, they, they mix up losing freedom with freedom. That's what they do. Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim of San Jose Bio Baptist Church. Have you ever asked this question that if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? My friend, it's so simple to get saved. You first got to realize that you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. And God, as a holy judge, he has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you feel sorry over your sinful condition. And if you do, there is hope for you. You see, Jesus, who is God, left heaven, came down here on earth, died on the cross, raised himself from the dead. Why did he do all that? So his blood can wash away the sins for you. So you see, that's your only way to heaven of what he did on the cross and not what you do in cleaning up all your sins and going to church, getting baptized, or doing any sort of good work. It's faith alone in what Jesus did on the cross. If you can do that, then all you have to do is say that to God. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I am sorry for being a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. I trust in that alone and not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? It's very simple, right? What did you do? I just put my faith on what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. My friend, congratulations on your salvation. Right now, because Satan can't damn you to hell, what he's going to try to do now is try to ruin your life. And he did a very good job in this world. That's why it's so hard to find truth, and there are so many lies with a gazillion different churches, different Bibles, different beliefs, different religions. So my friend, it is so important to grow in truth and get involved in a Bible-believing work that can save you from a lot of trouble. There are four things we recommend for you to do, which is found in the resources link below. Number one, get involved in a Bible-believing church near you. Number two, Study the King James Bible issue and have only that kind of Bible, no other modern version Bible. Number three, study dispensationalism so you can find the right doctrine and truth. Number four, study only under Bible-believing teachers. My friend, this is all explained further in the resources link below, so please click on it and get to work in a Bible-believing work because you only have one life to live for him and you don't want to waste it away by the devil. And I'll be inside that great palace and the smoke will be so thick. I'll drop to my knees and I'll drop to my face like those Navy SEALs do. And I'll start crawling. I'll start crawling. And I'll look down that uh, ivory aisle there and I'll see a, a throne. And I'll see some feet that got holes in them and they got jewel sandals on. Then I'll pull myself up to those feet and I'll cry on those feet like that woman that cried on his feet and wiped the tears with her hair. Hey, glory to God, you're going to let him do the shining. You're going to say, oh God, thank you. Hallelujah. And the angels will worship and the cherubim will worship and the seraphim will worship and thank God an independent Baptist will worship. Another song said, Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior Amen. to save a poor oh, soul like me. Woo! Glory to God. He stood out there in my Solomon and he's go, Ho, ho, ho! Jesus saves! <laughs> the Bible saves from God's And he's preaching, and the, and the people that's ringing the bell, there we go. Uh, <laughs> And he'd stand up, and, uh, and people walk up and they said, Wow, Santa Claus preaching. What? Then you enter the throne of glory. Yeah. Oh, the Father opens up his arms. Come on, there's a banner raised up in the sky with all the angels. You're going to the church.
It's not through Mohammed. He did not do anything for you. It's not through Buddha. It's not through the commandments. It's only through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to stay still and I'll just study at home. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, watch, I'll, I'll watch preaching on the TV. Uh, uh, you can turn the preacher off. You ain't going to turn me off. like your skin turning to gold or something, you don't know what's going on. It's about two more steps, here's that crowd. Hi, how you doing? Hey, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. Hey, like that? Way down there at the edge of that street, there's the Lord of Fed and glory. And down he comes off that throne. He always would come down for a sinner. <laughs> and he comes down there, well done, my good and faithful servant of the joy of our Lord. My little boy's heart going down there, it says, Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Then he laid down on that table, and Dr. Grace got out the scalpel, and he removed that old cold stony heart out of my friend. Oh, he threw it in the trash can, and he put a brand new heart into my friend's chest. And when he when he woke up, uh, he looked around and he said, "Oh my." Everything has been changed. Everything looks different. Oh, I'm so happy now that I had the heart operation. Hey, praise God, there's no other savior like our God.